right, well, as you know, we are taking three weeks here at the beginning of uh, fall semester season, and we're looking at one of the things that we call covenant practices. So these are habits or uh, action steps that you might call them um, that we as a group, as a church, have agreed to step into because we think they're a part of how we grow into the kinds of people that God intends for us to be, how we grow into the kind of community that we think God intends for us to be. And the practice we're discussing is gathering together on Sundays. And we're just asking the question, why? Why do we come together like this once a week the way we do? What's the point? What do we think is happening through our commitment to to do this together? And it's an important question to have an answer for because this is actually being here on Sundays is not the easiest discipline. There are a lot of things that seem shinier sometimes than being here on a Sunday. Brunch, travel sports, sleeping in, the lake, you have options and you're choosing to be here. And so we need to know what is the benefit that we think we're accruing by our participation here consistently on Sundays. It's important to know the answer to that. And it's one of those things that sometimes can just kind of go unspoken and unexplained. And as over time, we just go through the motions and we're doing it because this is what we do, I think. We're Christians. And so this is what we do. So we're trying to answer that question. This is the last week on in this short series before we will launch a, a larger fall series next week. And today I'm excited to teach on something that we're going to reintroduce, something that we have paused for a while due to COVID. But today we're going to reintroduce communion. And I want to talk about uh, what it signifies, what it means, what we think we're doing When we take communion together, Uh, and I will just tell you, it's COVID communion. It's not how we used to do it. It's worse. (laughs) Just call it what it is. We, instead of uh, a loaf of bread and a bowl of juice or wine that we dip that into, you're going to have an individual packet of juice with a very stale wafer that's on top that's going to be awkward to get out of, and it's still going to be very meaningful. It's going to be fine. And once it's safe, or at least seems safe, we can go back to maybe doing it how we did in the past. So I just want to explain today, why do Christians do communion, and what do we think is happening, and how should we think about it, lest it become yet another thing that we go through the motions on, and we do this because it's what we do, I think, and I'm not totally sure why or what I'm supposed to be doing, and I'm doing it, and now I forgot what I did in the first place. We don't want to find ourselves there. We want to be intentional and know what it is that we're doing. So that's what we're talking about. Luke chapter 22 is where we will start. We'll look at a few different passages of scripture today, and I'd love to just present to you some of the reasons behind and purposes of the sacrament of communion. So turn to Luke chapter 22. While you're turning there, I uh, want to quickly just say thanks to uh, those of you who are members who were with us over the weekend. We had our member kickoff weekend this past weekend. So we were together Thursday and Friday and Saturday and had some time to feast together, had some time to fast together, a lot of praying together, and then had some time just to, to have fun and, uh, and be together on Saturday, family reunion style. I personally found it to be a wonderful weekend. And I want to say thank you for participating. It was a lot. It was a big ask to ask you to spend that much time together. And so thank you for those of you who hopped in and were willing to take some chances and do some things that maybe were different than what you might normally uh, would do on a Thursday or a Friday or a Saturday. I'm, uh, I'm just grateful. I'm grateful for that. My heart is very full. My body is very tired. This, uh, this Sunday afternoon nap is going to slap. I'm looking forward to it. So Luke 22 Let's pick it up in uh, verse 14. And when the hour came, he, meaning Jesus, reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So let's explain for a second. If you're unfamiliar, the Passover, what Jesus just referenced, 
was a very important feast in Jewish history. It goes back to the time of enslavement to Egypt, when God brought down plagues on Egypt for refusing to let his people go out of slavery and to be freed to worship him. Pharaoh continually refused to let them go. And the last plague was that God killed the firstborn sons of the nation. And the narrative going on there was that if Egypt took God's son, Israel, then God would take their sons. And this was the act that eventually caused Pharaoh to relent and let Israel go. But for the Israelites, they were instructed to put the blood of a sacrificed animal onto the doorposts of their homes so that the angel would pass over their homes and spare their sons. It's a harrowing, harrowing story. And the sons of Israel were saved literally by the blood of a lamb. So Jesus here in Luke 22 says he's been looking forward to celebrating this Passover feast with his disciples. And there was these rituals that were full of symbolic meaning for the Israelites that were all part of this feast. And all through his earthly ministry, Jesus had been claiming to be the Messiah, this promised one that Israel was waiting for to bring salvation. And there was this sense of anticipation building as Jesus began to talk more openly about his death, which the disciples still didn't fully understand even at this point. And then Jesus says something very special about this Passover and how he will not partake of this feast again until the kingdom of God is inaugurated. So now keep reading verse 17. And Jesus took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And then he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. So a cup of wine and some broken bread. Jesus says, This is my body, about the bread, which is given for you. And he says, this cup that's poured out for you is a new covenant in my blood. And we don't know what all the disciples understood at this point, but this was category breaking. This was not a normal Passover meal anymore. Jesus says he was starting this new covenant, a new way of relating to God, the Father. And in just a few hours, Jesus would allow himself to be beaten, have his body literally torn to pieces by whips, and be hung on a cross where he would die for our sins. Three days later, he would raise from the dead to defeat sin and death and hell. And at some point in that process, the disciples that were sitting in the Passover here eventually understood, oh, that's what Jesus meant. Jesus is the new lamb. In the new covenant of grace, He is the sacrifice whose blood was spilt, causing us to be passed over by God's wrath, to be spared, saved, adopted into the eternal family of God. His body was broken for sinners like us. His blood was spilled for sinners like us. And as Jesus ascended into heaven and he sent the Holy Spirit to indwell Christians in the early church, the Spirit of God did exactly what Jesus said that he would. He brought to memory all the things that Jesus said. And what Jesus said here in this Passover meal was, do this in remembrance of me. So when you get together as Christians who've collectively come under the protection and salvation of Christ himself, we do this practice to remember and celebrate what Jesus has done to save us. Not to get too off topic, but the way that sex is a physical way to act out your covenant, your marriage covenant. Communion is meant to be a physical way of acting out our covenant with God. There's some parallels there. Okay, in the book of 1 Corinthians, we get a bit more instruction about communion. So flip over now to the book of 1 Corinthians. Let's look at chapter 10. First Corinthians chapter 10. This is Paul writing to the church in Corinth. This is a book of the Bible that we studied a couple of years ago and, and broke down this passage for those of you who remember that. He's writing primarily to correct them. That's the tone of the whole letter, and it is the tone that, that he strikes here as he's talking about communion, but there's some important insight that he gives. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we'll pick it up in verse 15. He says, I speak as to sensible people, judge for yourselves what I say. 
the cup of blessing, meaning the, the cup of wine or juice, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. So now just for context, this was a church of maybe 30, 40, 50 people that met in a house. So they get one loaf of bread and everyone takes a chunk of that bread and he's using it as an analogy where he's saying, just as all of you took a piece of the same loaf, we're all the same church, the same community, the same family, the same people. So he's arguing here that communion is meant to be a demonstration of our unity. That as we partake in communion, those of us who are Christians, we're showing that we're all in this together, that we all worship Jesus together, that we're all acknowledging we're sinners together, we're all going to heaven together, one day we're going to rise from the dead like Jesus together. And that Greek word for participation is the word koinonia, otherwise translated sometimes as fellowship or communion. If you've ever wondered why this practice is sometimes called communion, that's why. It's the Greek word that's used. And it denotes us all participating in Christ together communally as one family. We're communing with Jesus and with each other. Uh, in the early church, they actually sometimes called it a love feast. That was the term they used when they gathered for a meal that included communion. And it sounds a little hippie-ish, but it's actually this holy thing. And believe it or not, their culture was even more separated and stratified than ours is. People from all walks of life, Jew, Gentile background, slave or free, male or female, and they would all come together and share this meal just as Jesus taught. Keep reading in verse 18. Consider the people of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices participants in the altar? What do I imply then? That food, off <coughs> that food offered to idols is anything, or that an idol is anything? No, I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. Don't freak out, I'll explain. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall, shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? So in Corinth, there are multiple belief systems, multiple religions. They were polytheistic. They believed in a lot of gods who oversaw all sorts of various areas and spheres of life. And Paul is saying here that behind those false belief systems is actually demonic inspiration. Now, not demonic like what you see in the movies, but demonic lies leading people astray to believe things that are not true. And Paul's concern here is that the church in Corinth separate themselves from these false belief systems and these false practices. He's saying you can't be a Christian who plants your foot in the church as a Christian, getting up, taking communion, identifying yourself publicly with Jesus, but still have another foot on another team. So saying, I like this about Christianity, but I like this about this other belief system. I enjoy parts of the teachings of Jesus, but I also enjoy some of the parts of Buddhism. And some of these Christian values are great, but not everything is great. So I like to take parts of the Bible and combine that with other things that I like and sort of make up my own deal. To Paul here is saying communion requires that you be a Christian, that your faith and trust are fully in Jesus, that you're not knowingly and willingly taking parts of what Jesus says and following them, but then rejecting the parts that you don't prefer. It's not a deal that Jesus is willing to make. He's not going to negotiate with you. Like Jesus isn't going to say, if you obey my teaching about helping the poor, then I don't really care if you listen to me about how I said you should treat your spouse. It's not a deal that Jesus makes. He's patient, but he does not negotiate and so Paul here is saying, no, choose this day whom you will serve. You cannot serve Jesus as God and yourself or something else, someone else as God at the same time. You can't play your life like that. It can't be partly yours and partly God's. Either he's the authority over our lives, even when we don't like it, or he isn't. Those are the only two options. So communion is supposed to show our unity. It's also supposed to signify that Jesus is our God, whatever he says goes, that you and I are on team Jesus. And then Paul goes on into the topic of communion in chapter 11. So now skip to chapter 11 in 1 Corinthians. He brings the topic back up. Chapter 11, verse uh, 17 is where we'll pick it up. Uh, 
But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. There must be factions among you in, in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Exclamation point. Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. So we get a little more insight into their unity problems. And here's the situation. Their church gatherings were a little bit more like our life group meetings. It was done over a length of time, maybe even a whole day, and they shared a meal together. But what was happening was that some of the wealthier Christians were showing up early because they didn't have to work. They had wealth. So they showed up early and they brought all the food and the drink. And as the day went on, they ate and they drank everything. And then when the poorer folks got off of work and were able to make it over, the rich folks had already eaten everything. They'd already drunk everything. They're drunk off the communion wine and it's a mess. So Paul says that the wealthy are getting preferential treatment and they're being inconsiderate of those who have to work. And that those who are poor are not able to bring something for, for themselves and they needed the support and help of others. And this ancient world that the church in Corinth was in was rigidly divided. There were rich and poor, free, slave, Greek, barbarian, those who didn't speak Greek. They're Jews, many of whom became Christians, and they're Gentiles, who Jews had looked down on as long as anybody could remember. They're Roman citizens, and then there are those who aren't Roman citizens, who are viewed by lesser, as lesser breeds. There were the cultured and the ignorant. And the early church was supposed to be the one place where all these people from all those different stratified groups could and did come together. Because in Jesus, they found something that united them that was far bigger than any of the cultural differences that was dividing everyone in their society. Because there's no second-class citizens in the kingdom of God. And Paul says this meal that's supposed to bring you together and unify you around Jesus is actually causing divisions among you, he says to the church in Corinth, because you're acting like your culture and not like God's redeemed church. Verse uh, 23, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, that's what we just read from Luke took bread, and when he had given thanks, if you've ever heard another name for the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, it comes from this, the Greek word Eucharisto, or to give thanks. And he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, this is my body which I do for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, do it as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. He says, as we partake, we anticipate Jesus's return when he restores all that sin is broken here. So watch how seriously Paul calls us to approach this sacrament, this ritual that we call communion. Verse 27, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. That Greek word that's used for unworthy manner can also mean irreverent. He's saying we don't approach communion flippantly or as though it's some empty tradition. Verse 28, let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cups. So there should always be some self-inspecting that happens before we take communion. Verse 29, for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. Paul actually says that some of the, in the church have gotten sick and even died as a result of this. That it looked like it was natural causes, but their sickness and even death was a form of God's judgment for claiming to have aligned with Jesus, but hypocritically being content with sin in their lives. Strong words, verse 32. But when we are judged by the Lord, we're disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About the other things, I will give directions when I come. All right, so we've received the origin of communion from Luke, Last Supper of Jesus. 
And now that's the primary corrective teaching about it in Scripture, 1 Corinthians 10 and 11. So this morning, I'm going to invite you to the communion table, to the love feast. But first, Paul says we need to examine ourselves and make sure we're approaching with reverence. So in light of what I've said so far, let me end with four postures that we should take as we approach the communion table. Four ways that we might inspect ourselves for postures that we should take as we approach the communion table. Number one, first posture should be that Jesus is my God and whatever he says goes. This is what communion is meant to be a way of saying. It's meant to be a way of saying Jesus is my God, what he says goes. And to accept this invitation, we all have to repent of our sin and trust in Jesus. You have to turn your back on your old way of life and turn your face towards him. So if you think, well, I'm religious, okay? I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about Jesus. If you think I'm a good person, I'm not talking about morality. I'm talking about Jesus. And if you think, well, I've been burned by the church and Christians are hypocrites. I'm not asking about the church and I'm not asking about Christians. And if you think the church is full of hypocrites, you're wrong. We have a lot of them, but we're not full. We still have room for you. (laughs) So the question is, Have you rightly acknowledged Jesus as God? Have you accepted that he gives commands and not suggestions or options? Have you walked away from your old life to follow Jesus? Have you given your sin and your self-definition to Jesus and placed your faith in him to save you and make you right with God? This is a posture that we take when we approach the communion table. We examine our relationship with Jesus. Is there any unconfessed sin in my life? Is there any unrepentant sin in my life? Am I loving, trusting, following, and submitting to Jesus? The first way in which we inspect ourselves. Number two, posture that we take when we approach the communion table. We're saying this is who I am and everything else is a lie. This is who I am. Everything else is a lie. You and I are told a thousand lies every week about the story that we're living in, about who we are. And communion is a reminder of the actual story that we're in. This table tells us that we were so sinful, the Son of God had to die for us, but that we're so loved that he was glad to do so. This is a story that gives us great humility and great dignity. And the most important thing about you is your place in God's story. So when we take communion, we remember where we came from, that we were lost without God, without hope in the world. We remember the lengths that God went through to make our salvation possible. We remember that because of Jesus' sacrifice, this is where I am now. I'm part of the redeemed, washed, sanctified, historic, global, eternal family of God. And I don't, I don't want to say it in a way that any of you are getting hung up on the reverence stuff and you get nervous about taking communion like you dip the bread in the juice and you're worried lightning's about to strike you. That's not what I'm saying. If your faith is in Jesus, but you can't shake the feeling that God is disappointed in you, that you bother him, that he's frustrated, that you aren't further along than you are by now, then what you need is to remember that in your place condemned he stood and that you now stand before God as if you were Christ because Christ stood before God as if he were you. So Hebrews tells us we approach the throne of grace with confidence. So we check our hearts. And if there's unrepentant sin, then we address it with God. And then we approach the table with confidence because our story is no longer about our sin. Our story is about Jesus's righteousness. And if you're reconciled to God through the broken body and spilled blood of Christ, you are now a beloved child of God. And this is who you are. Everything else is a lie. And this is what we're remembering when we go to the communion table. Number three, third posture. We're remembering these are my people and nothing comes between us. Communion is supposed to be a way of saying, this is my family, these are my people, and nothing comes between us. We all take from the same loaf, as Paul says. It's an act that's supposed to showcase and solidify our unity in Christ. I'm more convinced than I ever have been of how badly we need this in our society. And I've been ranting on it as often as I can. It's like, it's almost like people think their job is to monitor everyone else, to try to catch other people doing something they disapprove of. 
And we are so suspicious of each other and distrusting and quick to judge. What are you saying? What are you doing? What are you posting? What's your opinion on this hot button issue? And if you don't answer the way I think you're supposed to answer, then I'm going to check you on it. How did you vote? And what's your opinion on masks? And are you vaccinated? Are you vaccinated? (laughs) And it's like we think we accrue social capital by catching someone doing something we find off wrong. All right, but listen, when we're here, when we go to the table for bread and juice or wine, we're admitting that we're broken and that we don't measure up and that we don't have what it takes and we probably won't answer all the questions correctly and that we're not even trying to play that game anymore. I'm not trying to be correct or acceptable socially or politically or whatever. I'm saying I need a savior. And this is what unites us. We're the united family of God. The broken body and shed blood of Christ make all our other differences pale in comparison. And so nothing should come between us. And so some of you may have tension in your relationships here, and maybe it's been months or years and you haven't dealt with it. You haven't approached the other person to lovingly confront or patiently forgive or clarify weirdness. In the book of Matthew, Jesus actually says, whether it's your sin or someone else's sin that has caused a relational rift, the impetus is still on you to go and reconcile no matter what. And so maybe for some of you today, you need to grab someone and have a quick conversation before taking communion today. This is our third posture. I'll tell you a story real quick. Uh, Aunt Frederick, our pastor of our Two Notch Church, said that a few months ago they were taking communion. And he, he mentioned beforehand, if there's anything that seems off with you and another believer in the room, you need to clarify that and come together so that you can take communion together as the reconciled family of God. And so he was watching people take communion and said he walked over to the communion table. He took his bread. He dipped it in the juice. He was pulling it towards his mouth as his friend Jamal goes, not so fast. <laughs> You're not ready for it yet. <laughs> And Aunt said him and Jamal stood over to the side and talked as the juice dripped down his hand and began to drip off his elbow. And they talked out what they needed to talk out. And they hugged. And then he put the very, very soggy bread in his mouth as he remembered that Jesus' blood made it possible for him and Jamal to forgive each other and love each other as family in spite of any conflict that might come between them. He said he had already activated his words. I had activated my bicep. That's how close I was. Like the bicep had been activated to get that to my mouth. He said, not so fast, my man. That's the level of urgency the Bible puts on us being right with each other. This is our family. Nothing comes between us. Number four, fourth posture. Jesus is what I need most. It's the fourth posture that we're taking. Jesus is what I need most. So out of all the symbols or rituals that Jesus could have chosen, why did he choose a meal? You know, many ancient gods were represented by impressive statues. Worshippers would come and bow down and worship. And then here's Jesus instead, just sitting around a table with close friends, men he'd come to love. And he chooses a warm meal, hearty bread and wine. The God of the universe sat around a table and had friends. And he chose a ritual that can be done anywhere because Jesus goes with you wherever you go. And this is a meal that's been observed and celebrated from homes to cathedrals all across the globe, all across time. There's no pilgrimage required, only some simple elements and some Christians. And he chose something that you have to put inside your body, something you ingest. And there's meaning in that as human beings who can't continue to live without ingesting food and liquid. And Jesus did this after he called himself the bread of life, the fountain of living water, after he claims that he will need to come and live inside of us through his spirit. His cleansing, redeeming work goes all the way into the inside, the deepest parts of us. So I don't know if you've ever felt like God isn't there, like he's abandoned you. But if you've ever felt that way or even feel that way now, do you know that the communion table deeply disagrees with you? It calls you to come, taste, and see that you are not, in fact, forgotten by God. You chew the bread and you taste 
the juice, and you know that Jesus will never leave you or forsake you, that by his spirit he abides in you, and that Jesus is what you ultimately need, and Jesus is what you've been given. So as we take communion, I just invite you today to glance around the room a bit. I want you to think about all the stories that are here, all the backgrounds represented here, all the supernatural work that God's done in people's lives, the freedom that's been found, the conflicts that have been worked through, forgiven and covered by love. I want you to see that hundreds of people who are here for another week proclaiming that Jesus is what they need most. I want you to see us taking communion together with all of our differences and sin and tensions. I want you to see it for what it is. It's a miracle. And as we week in and week out approach this ritual with these things in mind over time, we become people of the table, people who are growing in Christ likeness to become full of grace because we know how much we need it. People who reconcile quickly with extravagant mercy, people who take our unity as a church very seriously, people who have a smile in the face of life's challenges only because we know a table is coming in eternity that will make all of this difficulty pale in comparison. So you and I, depending on the week, might walk in here running on fumes, full of shame, clinging to our mental health, massively confused, or at the very least, well in need of a crisp reminder of God's never-changing covenant love for us. And this is the invitation we have, to come to the table, to approach the table with reverence, with the right postures after we examine ourselves. So as the band comes back up to lead us, we're going to take some time to examine ourselves, to think through these four postures. Let's do whatever work we need to do, and then let's go to the table together. We've got stations scattered throughout the room. There is a gluten-free option in the very back directly across from me. And so take some time to reflect, to make sure you have the appropriate posture, do whatever work you need to do, and then let's step in to a beautiful tradition and take communion together. Let me pray.